Here's a look at the whole thing that we ultimately build in today's video. I don't talk too much about what materials to use while I'm building this one. Uh, just be smart about it. Remember, magma is very hot and you'll need steel for anything that touches it. Tiles and stuff, obsidian and ceramic uh, work well. In places where there's hot igneous rock, you don't really need steel anymore, but it's still a very high temperature, so go with something like iron. I used steel for the aqua tuners. Also, I should mention that I was using the sandbox to make this. I think it would be pretty challenging to do with actual duplicates. I mean, definitely doable, but it would be challenging. Uh, so don't don't jump into it, you know, thinking that this you're going to be able to pound this out real quick in your base uh, without a little thinking through how to put it together. This video is about melting regolith to generate power from the heat. This is the final product I came up with. It uses one rail of regolith, and you should be able to get three rails of regolith continuously from your meteor showers. Uh, so you could make three of these. This one is set up to power 27 steam turbines. Uh, when I do the math, it seems like I should be able to produce about 23,000 watts. Um, but in practice, I'm getting about 13,000 watts. There are some points I need to make before we get started, so I'm going to talk about those, and while I'm talking, I'm just going to flip through all of my previous designs that I was experimenting with. The principle that makes this work is that is the change in specific heat when you melt regolith into magma. Since the specific heat of magma is five times more than the specific heat of regolith, if you melt regolith into magma, then you get five times as much heat energy out of it when you cool it down than it took to warm up the regolith in the first place. So that's already kind of a cool thing, but the way to make it really cool is if you use the hot regolith, well, the magma, to warm up even more regolith. That way you don't have to, you know, generate any heat in order to melt more regolith. The trouble with that is that heat exchange can never be 100% efficient. So you can warm it up to almost melted using the regolith that you heated up already, but you can never quite melt it unless you have an extra additional source of heat to push it up the last few degrees. And that's kind of the point of the volcano. Um, but you don't need much of that heat. You just need those last few degrees. It turns out you don't actually need magma from a volcano, although that's what I'm going to use in this video. The heat that's produced by a metal refinery that uses molten glass as the coolant is more than sufficient in order to generate enough heat. In this video, the challenge is to melt all of your regolith that comes from space from meteor showers into magma and use the heat that you generate to power as many steam turbines as possible. In most of my experiments, I was trying to figure out how to process three rails of regolith all, of the, all at the same time. Uh, it turns out I think this is a bad move. In every way, it's easier if you just make three regolith melters, one for each rail of regolith. Three rails of regolith is probably too much for any base because you have to have so many steam turbines and heat sinks that it really will kind of take up your entire asteroid. In my experiments, I got to a point where I could generate 45,000 watts of power net um, just from melting regolith and using very little heat from the volcano. So we're starting with this nice simple volcano. But first, some terminology. To me, these are chunks of igneous rock, and these are blocks of igneous rock, or maybe tiles of igneous rock. And now I want to teach you about a pitfall that is a problem for probably all volcano tamers. What happens is when liquids like magma, when they cool off and combine themselves with existing chunks of, you know, whatever they freeze into, like for magma, if it freezes into igneous rock and there's already an existing chunk of igneous rock in that spot, then the heat in the magma is lost. So in order to demonstrate this, I put a chunk of igneous rock down here, and I'm going to fill this little room full of something very cold. And now I'm just going to spill some magma on top of it. Some magma in here. I'm going to pause this, and we can have a look at some temperatures. See, the igneous rock, I'm hovering over it with my mouse, it's negative 40.8 degrees. You know, the, the magma up here being 1,700 degrees, if it were to cool down enough to turn into a, a chunk, of igneous rock and get merged into this chunk, you'd think the temperatures would just be combined together and you'd get some value in between. The magma will run off this, fall down into here, and the supercoolant will begin cooling it down. Now you'll notice that the supercoolant is not cooling down the igneous rock right now. That's because this is a vacuum. It doesn't have any contact with that. So the supercoolant can only cool down the magma. Here it comes. Magma is falling off the edge, falling all the way down to the bottom, being instantly cooled by the supercoolant and merging into this chunk of rock. 
Now I'm going to hover over it with my mouse. You can see the mass of the rock is increasing as the magma gets added to it, but its temperature is staying exactly the same. This is an important dynamic to understand really anytime you're working with magma and you want to keep the heat energy. There's a couple of ways to avoid this problem. One of them is to make sure that the rock that magma might merge into is the same temperature that magma freezes into rock. The other way is to make sure that magma never melts into rock like this. In this build, I use the first of those two options. All right, it all starts here with just a simple volcano. So the very first thing we need is a way to melt the regolith that arrives at the volcano. The first time we turn this on, the regolith won't be preheated. So we need a way to get a lot of heat into the regolith quickly or else it will just take forever to get the whole machine started. I'm making the insulation out of ceramic. I'm gonna make a column of obsidian tiles, two of them next to each other and then put in a couple of temp shift plates in order to sort of push the heat into those tiles. So this part of the obsidian will be very hot all the time, uh, but we don't want very hot all the time. We only want very hot when we're first turning on the machine uh, because we really just want to heat the regolith just enough to turn it into magma and not anymore. If we heat it too much, then we're using more heat than necessary. So in order to do that, I'm going to extend this into a very long column. Now the idea is, so this part up here is very hot. So this tile will be very hot, but this one will be cooler, and this one will be cooler, and this one will be cooler. Assuming that there's regolith moving through this, it'll keep the bottom a bit cooler, and the top will stay very hot, and somewhere in between, the regolith will hit a point where it's hot enough to melt into magma, and then fall out of these tiles. Uh, we want it to fall out on the right side, and you can make that happen just by having something on the left. And we need insulation anyway, so I'm just going to put the insulation there. I'll put in a rail that will carry regolith up through these tiles, and at the top, put it in a loop so that it just keeps running through the tiles until it melts. Let's do it like this. There we go. So regolith will come up this tower, heating itself very slowly, and if it gets this far, then well, it just needs it to be heated quickly in order to get the job done. So it goes into this loop and runs in a circle until it melts. But I don't want the regolith to melt right at the top, then pop up through the tile. I want it to always come out the side as magma. There we go. Now on the right side of this, more insulation. Now you'll notice there's an open spot between the volcano and the column that our magma falls down. When this room gets full of magma, it just runs over the side. Unless you have something else to do with your magma, it's easy to just let it fall onto the into the system that we're making and add itself to the heat that we're turning into power. The regolith turns into magma and it falls down this tower. And all the way down at the bottom, I want a heat sink that soaks up that heat to preheat regolith on its way into the melter. Just put some metal tiles at the bottom rewide. Sometimes you'll get a lot of magma falling down here and you don't want it to, to pile up so that there's a lot of magma and have it freeze into blocks. You only want it to freeze into chunks. By having it three wide it spreads out a little bit and mitigates that problem. Leaving a spot here so I can reach through with a auto sweeper and pick up the chunks of magma. So if I put an auto sweeper right there then it can reach through that corner and get these two spots. I still need one that can grab igneous rock from that spot. I'm just going to use another auto sweeper for that. That one can get that spot and this one can get these two spots. These metal tiles down here are the heat sink, but we need something with a very high heat capacity for this. One of the things that will happen is sometimes this will, will get too much heat down here. It won't be cold enough to freeze the magma into rock and so the magma will pile up until there's too much of it and when it does freeze it will freeze into a block. The way to deal with that problem is to have a heat sink with so much heat capacity that its temperature can only change change very slowly. So even when there's a lot of heat going into it, it doesn't heat up very much. So a temp shift plate has 800 kilograms of mass, but even so, its heat capacity is only 0.5. We really need something that's much more substantial than that. I think the best thing in the game is water, or well, steam, actually. Uh, so we're gonna have a room full of steam down here. By the way, the reason to reach through here with the auto sweepers, is you can't have them sort of in the same room. They'll overheat. By making them reach through a wall, we can put them in a separate room like this and control the temperature of that room so they don't overheat. There's other ways to deal with that problem, but I like this one for this build. So this will be the room full of steam. Put some more temp shift plates in this room in order to keep 
the temperature nice and even. Our rail for regolith will come in from the side, then up into the regolith melter. After the magma falls down and turns into igneous rock, the auto sweepers pick it up and we put it in a conveyor loader. I'm actually going to use two conveyor loaders. This provides a bit of a buffer space for igneous rock, provides another target for the auto sweepers to load so they don't conflict with each other so much. The igneous rock that comes out of the auto loaders, route it through the steam room, out on a rail, its job is to pre-warm the regolith coming in on the other rail. So we'll have to make a heat exchange over here. I used the sandbox to make this a vacuum. Making a vacuum is a non-trivial task, but there's a lot of ways to do it, and I'm not going to show you how in this video. I'm going to put one metal tile inside the steam room. The purpose of this is to transmit heat from this platform down to the bottom of the steam room, so that when there's only water in here and no steam, it can still be heated. Now I don't want to just fill this room full of lots of steam at high pressure. Um, if there's too much in there when the when the device is trying to start up then it will be very difficult to warm it up and it will just take forever but if there's too little then of course it won't do its job of keeping the temperature in here stable so i'm going to make a thing that figures out sort of dynamically on its own what the right amount of steam is thermo sensor and i'll have an input for water put a liquid shut off here to control when the water flows in connect that to the thermo sensor um, of course it won't work unless there's a little bit of something in the room right now it's a vacuum and so there's nothing for the thermo sensor to take a temperature of so i need to put a little water water in there to start. I'm just going to use this Atmos sensor so that I can control it manually. That's enough. So great, our steam room is set up. When it gets too hot, it will add water and create more steam, which has the effect of stabilizing the temperature. And eventually, we'll have enough steam in here that it will never need to add any more water. In practice, this turns out to be around 50 kilograms per tile. I'm going to set the auto sweepers to accept anything that lands down here and power. Eventually we'll have active cooling for this room. Lay the pipes. Um, I want to fill this room with chlorine. Chlorine has a very low conductivity. The hot igneous rock that's in this room won't give up as much heat as it otherwise would. There we go. That means when you build this room, you're probably going to want to put a vent in here something like that, so that you can get the chlorine in. We're almost ready to turn this on for the first time. The last thing that we need is a heat exchange. When the igneous rock comes out this rail, it needs to warm up the regolith that's going in on that rail. This is absolutely key in order for a regolith melter to generate a lot of heat, because if you just use the magma to warm it up, your magma will get cold very quickly and you won't be able to do it anymore. I'm going to use window tiles for this made of diamond. The only reason I'm doing that is so that it's easy to see what's going on underneath them in the demo. You can use anything that won't melt. Iron is sufficient. I have an entire video about heat exchanges in case you're interested. Uh, for this heat exchange, I'm going to make heat sinks that have 10 tiles in them. I think you need probably about three. Uh, to be on the safe side and make this really efficient, I'm going to use four. We'll see how that goes. These are the heat sinks. All of them together is a heat exchange. This is the rail for the regolith. And I'll just wrap it through the heat sinks like this. This is the rail for the... Oh, I didn't do a good job. This is the rail for the igneous rock. And I'll wrap it through the heat sinks like this. And that ought to be a fairly good heat exchange. Designing heat sinks for um, conveyor rails tends to be fairly challenging. I think the big reason is because conveyor rails move 20 kilograms of material per second, so it takes twice as long for anything to warm up or cool down. One giant heat sink that we use to fuel our steam turbines. I put a rail of regolith coming down the right side of my map that I can hook up to this. It just comes from space. I have a big setup up here. Its only job is to just harvest the regolith that falls from meteors. You'll definitely want to enclose this in insulation or something. So that rail carries the regolith in, and this rail carries the igneous rock out. For now, I'll just dump out the igneous rock at the end and finish building the heat exchange with these, uh, these window tiles. Enclose this in insulation. All right, let's try it out. Regolith is coming in on this rail. The regolith has reached our heat exchange part. Oh, geez. Let me change my UI setting so that the, the user interface is bigger so you can read it. Sorry about that. Now, the regolith is going up through the obsidian tiles, and those get increasingly hotter and hotter. But the regolith hasn't been pre-warmed right now. It's not hot enough to melt it. When it gets all the way to the top, these tiles are actively kept very hot. The regolith is melting. And when it melts, it pops out the right side of these tiles as magma. 
can see these uh, drops of magma falling down the tower. This has a secondary benefit. As it falls down, it's in contact with the obsidian, so it will drop off its heat in the obsidian tiles until it freezes into igneous rock. There it goes. It froze into igneous rock and it will fall the rest of the way down. This is very beneficial because it means the igneous rock that's falling isn't even as hot as it needs to be in order to turn into magma. It's already exchanged some of its heat with the tiles that are being used to warm up the regolith. That effect makes this obsidian tower amazingly efficient as a heat exchange. When the igneous rock gets to the bottom, the auto sweeper picks it up, puts it in the auto loader, it goes out on this rail through our steam room to warm up the steam and then in the, into the heat exchange to warm up the regolith in the heat exchange. Eventually, it goes out into the final heat sink, whose job is to feed heat to steam turbines, which we haven't set up yet. I'm going to speed this up, and we can get an idea of how it works as it warms up. You'll see it's not running at full capacity yet. The heat sinks aren't, and such aren't warmed up enough to really get the regolith to a high enough temperature to melt quickly. First heat sink in our heat exchange is up to 340. We need these temperatures to get up close to 1400 degrees in order to hit our efficiency targets. As the temperature of the regolith going into the melter increases, the melter becomes more and more efficient. We're already up to 700 degrees, so we're using half as much heat from the magma as we were originally. I'm a little concerned about the temperature of our magma. Uh, this is one eruption worth of magma from this volcano. Once this whole thing gets started, it uses very, very little heat from the magma. It actually uses quite a bit in order to start up for the first time. It probably would have been better to wait for two eruptions of the volcano before I turned it on. So this is taking an excessively long time to get started, and I'm absolutely sure it's because I didn't wait for a second eruption from the volcano, so the temperature of our magma is getting a little weak. I don't want to cheat and paint in some magma, so I think I'm going to wait it out. Let's talk about conveyor rails and insulation. You'll notice that the insulation just below conveyor rails gets very hot. This is a weird property of conveyors. Uh, a thing that's on a conveyor rail transfers heat with the tile that it's in and the tile directly under it, and that includes insulated tiles. As a result, all the tiles underneath the conveyor rail are getting very hot. I'm just going to put in oh, another layer of insulation in order to prevent that from being a problem with the rest of the base. So the regolith going into the regolith melter right now is a bit under 1200 degrees. Ideally, it would be about 1400. We're not getting to that temperature very quickly because our magma is too cold. So since this is taking a really long time to start up, I paused the video recording and went back and tried to start it again after the volcano had erupted two times. When you do that, it takes about three cycles in order to get running to full speed. And that's pretty on par with my expectations. So lesson learned, let the volcano erupt two times before you turn it on or prepare to wait. Looks like we have five cycles to go. I'm just going to uh, cut out that wait. All right, so that's erupting. The magma is getting hot again. So our regolith is melting. It looks like we've almost got that full rail of regolith going in non-stop. Well, there we go. All we needed was a second eruption. Our heat exchange is working. Let's put in some steam turbines. I'm going to delete the insulation on top of this heat sink and start making some steam turbines to go right on top of it. So we'll have a steam room on top of another conducting material. I'm going to use a diamond window again. Um, but of course, again, that's just so it's easy to see what's happening in the demo. You could probably just use iron and it would be just fine. Space uh, for steam that in a room that's three high, room that's four high for the steam turbines. Let's start with four steam turbines. I'm gonna actually leave the side open so that my dupes can get in here. So the heat will get into the steam room through these doors. When the doors are closed, they transmit heat from this glass into that glass. I like to put two doors under each steam turbine and a little insulation between them. The steam turbines each need an output for the water they produce. By the way, if you just wanted to know how to melt regolith, you're pretty much done with this video. Uh, but there's a lot of additional nuance to setting up the steam turbines and making them work consistently. I'll use one aqua tuner to cool this stuff. So there's a way to set up an aqua tuner so that you can run a continuous loop of water that runs nonstop even when the aqua tuner is off. The way I do it is like this. Water comes in this side, and if the aqua tuner is off, it goes over that port and into this bridge and then into this pipe. And if the aqua tuner is on, it goes through the aqua tuner and into this pipe. And the interesting thing about setting it up exactly like this is that a packet of water that comes in this side will end up in exactly the same spot in this pipe, regardless of whether it goes through the bridge or the aqua tuner. 
So it should be impossible for this to get stuck into stutter and jerk and stop. There we go. Um, now we still need to get water into the cooling loop and you can actually just use the steam that's coming out of one of the steam turbines to do that. So I'm just going to put in a bridge right there and that'll fill up the cooling loop. We need to put some automation in the steam room so that it, when it's not hot enough, it closes the doors and lets more heat in. Um, I'm going to put them sort of on the right end of each pair of doors and we'll connect them up just like that. I like to set those to above 190. Uh, our target temperature is 200, but when there's things like aqua tuners and stuff also in the steam room making heat, I like to leave a little margin. Our aqua tuner also needs some automation. I'm going to put a liquid pipe thermo sensor right here. I'll use that sensor to make sure that water that is too cold to go through the aqua tuner without being frozen doesn't. So the water has to be above 14 degrees. Also, I don't want the aqua tuner to turn on and off really quickly, so I'm going to put a filter gate in here and set it to 10 seconds. That way when the aqua tuner turns off, it will definitely stay off for at least 10 seconds. I'll wire those together. I also want to use a thermo sensor to force the steam turbines to turn on if it gets too hot in the steam. So this thermo sensor will turn this steam turbine on if it's too hot, no matter what even if we don't have to generate the extra power. Right now, this seems like a strange thing to want to do, because how is it going to get too hot in the steam? But as the build progresses, you'll see why it's necessary to have this check in place. Set it to 250. Now I'll set that up for each of the steam turbines. Now I want to wire all of this up for power, but I also want my dupes to have access to these rooms. So I'm going to create an airlock over here on this side and I'm going to run a heavy watt cable through the airlocks in order to do the wiring. I'm just going to use a fancy visco gel airlock. I made two membranes with a vacuum in between so that heat can't escape from these rooms. I'm going to put a power transformer here to power the doors. You don't technically need to power these doors. They'll open and close anyway, but I like to do it. Of course, you need to make sure that there's steam in the steam room. Um, I did that last, which is sort of backward. You should probably start out by making this a vacuum or filling it with steam in some way instead of building everything and then trying to do it. Regardless, I think finding making a vacuum and filling a room full of one thing is sort of outside the scope of this video. I should probably do another video just about that. I'm going to keep the amount of steam fairly low. It's 100 kilograms per tile. There's a reason for this that I should probably talk about later. Okay, so our steam turbines are ready to go for the first time. I see the steam turbines won't turn on because of the thermo sensor I added for automation. I intended to add batteries to control the steam turbines later, but apparently with the automation set up this way, I need to put them in now. So I'm going to put a battery over each steam turbine to control whether it turns on to generate power. You know what? I'm going to put them much higher to accommodate some more space that we're going to need for something later. I'm way up here. I should connect the power to the batteries so that they charge and then stop charging when they get full. But that's not what I want to demonstrate at this time. Let's just let the steam turbines run nonstop. One aqua tuner cooling water has the capacity to cool something like 15 steam turbines. So using one on four steam turbines is somewhat overkill. But I like to leave a very large margin for this. And there's a good reason for it that will become apparent later in the build. As you can see, the doors are doing their job, letting heat in from the heat sink to warm up the steam to near 200 degrees. This will keep the steam turbines running at their capacity. So the cooling loop is filling up with water so the aqua tuner can keep the atmosphere in here with the steam turbines cool. That's the basics of the steam turbine setup. I'm just going to repeat this as far down the heat sink as I need to in order to reach about 20 kilowatts of power output from the steam turbines. I chose that number because it's the maximum that you can put on a single heavy watt wire. Also the continuous power generation capacity of a single rail regolith melter is only about 13,000 watts, um, at least in practice. I'm going to build out the rest of these steam turbines up to 20,000 watts and cut out that part of the video. I built out 23 steam turbines using the same pattern. This will give us a maximum possible output of almost 20,000 watts of power. As you'll see by the end of this video, there's actually a good reason to add even more steam turbines. Uh, this will eventually work like a giant heat battery so that when you're not using the power, it can store up more and increase its maximum 
maximum power output, although its continuous power output will always be around 13,000 watts. So far this is a fairly good setup as it is, but it has some issues. So the first point that we need to have a look at is that the igneous rock, it escapes and it's still quite hot, 400 degrees at this point. We want to continue using the heat out of that rock until there's nothing left to use, otherwise we're not being efficient. I want to redirect this rail to go up over the steam turbines. If we use the water that's coming out of the steam turbines, which is 95 degrees, uh, to cool off the igneous rock, then we can get it all the way down to 95 degrees, and that I think is the most efficient cooling we can do with a steam turbine. We have to redirect the water from a steam turbine to go up through a valve in order to break it, at, break it up into 1,000 kilogram per second pipes. The reason to do that is that 1,000 kilograms per second in a pipe will not turn into steam and uh, break the pipe until after it exits the pipe. We'll set that to 1,000 grams per second, and then we can direct those pipes up through another, a different heat sink, and then back down into the steam room. I see now that I've made another mistake, and I've, I've routed the cooling pipe incorrectly in order to let this make this possible. The water comes out of the steam turbine here, goes through the liquid valve to break it up into one kilograms per second in each of two pipes. Run through some kind of a heat sink, like that, and then the two pipes go back down into the steam room, come out the vents. And I'm just going to continue that pattern all the way down for all of the steam turbines. This is what the finished product looks like for three steam turbines. Notice I had to reroute my cooling loop because I didn't do a good job of that earlier. I'm going to build it out for the rest of the steam turbines and I'll cut out that part so you don't have to watch. All right, I finished building all of that out and this is what it looks like. We need to redirect that igneous rock to go across the top in a heat sink so that these pipes can soak up that extra heat. So I'm going to redirect that up to the top. I think I will try serpentining this. I'll just put a conveyor chute on the end. And of course we need, uh, you know, something to use as a heat sink along this. I'm just going to use diamond window tiles just like I've used everywhere else. And I'll wrap that in some insulation. Since I have this rock exposed to the air, I'm also going to wrap that in insulation in its own little chamber to keep the heat from escaping into the base. As you can see, the hot rock, oh boy. All right, so the hot igneous rock is now being redirected up here above the steam turbines and into this heat sink. That's the water that comes from the steam turbines is going through the heat sink and picking up that heat, putting it into the steam chamber. At the moment, the heat sink isn't warm enough. In fact, it's cold enough that it's really becoming a problem for the steam turbines. It's cooling down uh, the steam instead of warming it up. But once enough rock has passed through this, that won't be a problem anymore. All right, I'm gonna speed this up and let it run for a while, and then we can have a look at the results that we're getting. I let this run long enough to reach a pretty fair equilibrium. The igneous rock is coming out of this last heat exchange at 93 degrees. The steam under the steam turbines is largely, is very close to 200 degrees, which is just what we want. So we still have some issues to deal with, and then some polish to put on the entire machine. The first issue is we're using this to power things in our base, but it's sort of just running freely right now. We need to choke it so that we only make as much power as we need, and we kind of save up the energy uh, when we don't need it. That's kind of tricky to do because we have a supply of rock, hot rock, that's going through it all the time. If we just turn off the steam turbines, then that rock won't get cooled off and uh, it'll end up piling up out here at something like 1400 degrees. If we just prevent the rock from moving, then the steam turbines will cool it down and uh, then when we need the power and we turn them on, they won't have any heat to, to work with. If we do both of those things at the same time, where we turn off the movement of the rock through the heat sinks and we turn off all of the steam turbines, then that does two things that I dislike. One of them is that it turns off something like 20 kilowatts of power to your base all at the same time and then turns it back on again, and you have to manage that in your power grid. The other thing that it does is it doesn't prepare the steam turbines so that they're ready to go, go at full capacity when you do need them. You could take that idea another step and incrementally turn off some of the steam turbines as you need less and less power, um, but then you have to somehow keep the rock moving, but 
but a few steam turbines don't have the ability to cool the rock off all the way. Then you have to stop the rock sometimes, and this becomes very, very difficult to do with automation and keep it all balanced. Another problem is that the rock that's coming out is still 93 degrees. That's still pretty hot in terms of something, you know, that's just in your base. Probably we'd like to cool that down even more. I worked out a way to kill all of these birds with one stone, but first let's set up the rest of the power grid so that we can demonstrate supplying power to a power load. For the power load, I'm going to use refrigerators. So let's set up 13,000 watts of refrigerators. And we'll connect all of those to power. Also, let's connect all these batteries to power. Now I want to set these batteries so that the steam turbines turn off incrementally as our power needs decrease. I'm going to start on the right side. These are the last steam turbines that we want to turn off. I'm going to set the high threshold for the battery to 95, and I'll put the low threshold 20 degrees cooler than that, 75. Now I'm just going to copy that to the last three batteries uh, so that the last three steam turbines will turn off in conjunction with each other. The next set of three batteries, I'm going to set 5% less than that. So the second set of batteries I want to go to 70%, uh, the low threshold. And I'll copy that to those three. And the next set of three batteries I want to go to 65%. The next set of three is 80 and 60. The last two on the end can be five less at 60 and 40. Now to demonstrate that, I'm going to cut off some of our power load uh, so that we're able to make more power than we're using. First ones to turn off should be down here on the end. That should manage the steam turbines so that they're only producing as much as we're using. Okay, our first couple sets of batteries have turned off their steam turbines, so we've found a balance with these first five steam turbines off. Of course, now we're not doing, doing as much cooling. So we need to um, deal with all of those other problems I was talking about. In a time like this, we have surplus power capacity. We're able to produce more power. And we want to cool down the rock. One way to do that is to use aqua tuners. Lucky for us, we already have a bunch of aqua tuners, and they're cooling down the, uh, the atmosphere behind the steam turbines. Since we have excess power capacity and we have aqua tuners, why don't we just use them to cool down the rock? And this will also have the side effect of moving the heat from the rock into the steam. So all we have to really do is redirect the rock. It goes into the atmosphere behind our steam turbines. That way the aqua tuners can cool it off and we'll have nice cold rock and the heat will end up in the steam where we want it. There are some risks to doing this. One of them is that the aqua tuner warms up the steam too much because the steam turbine isn't necessarily running. That's why we have these thermosensors here to turn on the steam turbine no matter what if the steam gets to be 250 degrees. Now let's suppose we turn off the power load completely just to demonstrate an extreme situation. I'm going to disconnect all of the refrigerators. What that means is these batteries will tend to fill up with power and turn off all of the steam turbines. The dynamic I wanted to show you with this test is you'll see that the steam in the steam room reaches its maximum temperature at about 200 degrees. What that means is all of these steam turbines are ready to turn on and go at their full capacity as soon as you need the power. We're heating up this steam room like it's a battery, making all of these steam turbines ready to go. You could theoretically extend this to have even more steam turbines and use it like a heat battery so that if the power needs in your base spike frequently, you have a lot of steam turbines ready to get on it. Right now, all of our steam turbines have turned off because the batteries are charged all of the way. So everything is quite balanced, except for one thing. Um, when you're not using a lot of power from these steam turbines and you're not cooling down the rock at all for a long time, uh, then you can get a situation and then goes into your steam turbine room at an extremely high temperature and your steam turbines will overheat and everything is going to get broken. The way to deal with this, once these rooms are all up the temperature, turn off the flow of rock. Uh, the way we know that all of the steam is up the temperature is if these thermosensors are all green, meaning all of these doors are open. We're going to add a bunch of automation now to detect that and turn off the rock when that happens. Well, the way that's really convenient to do it in the sandbox is we'll just stick some knot gates on here on each of these so that when all of them are open the output from the knot gates turns green and we'll just run an automation wire across the outputs of all of those knot gates and we'll send that up here to a shutoff there 
Once our steam heat battery is all charged up, then these doors will open and the flow of rock will be cut off. All right, so let's have a look at the high power behavior, connecting all of these refrigerators again. That will start turning on the steam turbines from right to left. So I think that's all we need to do with the steam turbines and power management. It seems like we're overloading the circuit and I'm not sure how that's happening. Potential power consumed is a little over 20 kilowatts. Oh, that makes sense actually, because I have aqua tuners on the same circuit. That's a manageable thing if you use a more sophisticated power grid. And I don't want to get into how to do a power grid right now. All right, so we've introduced another problem, unfortunately. When, when we stop the flow of rock, the rock piles up here, magma. Um, I'm a little bit surprised by that. Oh, you know what? I was supposed to put a temp shift plate right here. Um, wow, putting one in there now, if I'd forgotten it and I was using not using the sandbox would be a mess. I'm gonna drop it in there right now. Any heat that's up here can be transferred into these tiles and transferred into the steam very quickly. All right, so let's say that we stop the output of rock for a long time. Instead of sweeping the rock and sending it into the heat sinks and stuff, the rock will just pile up right here. We don't really want that to happen. I would much rather that um, we stop putting regolith into the melter so that we don't just have a giant pile of rock for no reason. I'm going to control that by putting in some automation. Surprise! I'm going to put in weight plates, made of steel of course because it's very hot over here, to detect when rock is sitting in any of these places. When there is a pile of rock here, I want to stop the flow of regolith. So I can put a, a conveyor shut off there. If this isn't something that you care about, like you're okay with hundreds of tons of igneous, hot igneous rock piling up in here, and uh, you just want to melt all the regolith you can, then I guess you don't have to worry about this. Um, now I'm gonna put an automation wire out here. I'm gonna use a memory gate for this because instead of, instead of trying to do this continuously, it's just a lot simpler to do it once a day. If this is clear, there's no rocks on top of the plates, this wire will be green. You can turn the memory toggle on and let regolith through like that. I'm going to run it around this way, just like that. And once a day, I'm going to turn the memory toggle off uh, so that it turns off the regolith until the weight plates are clear. In other words, until all of the all of the igneous rock has been moved. Active duration, we just need to click it on once a day. That's it. So another thing that will happen is the magma eventually in this room up here will start to overflow. The problem is, while this is erupting, you can get an entire eruption full of magma down this chute all at the same time, and it will overload It'll overload this whole system, freeze into blocks, and everything will be broken. So I'm just going to set up a magma dropper door whose job is to just make sure that it doesn't go all at once. I'll turn it around like that. So I'm making a timer right now using a buffer gate and a not gate pointing opposite directions. There we go. Now watch what this does. I'll slow it down. Every five seconds, the red wire just flashes green, just like that. And the green wire also flashes red every five seconds just enough to flash and that's all. And you can change that duration just by changing the time on the buffer gate. Now I'm going to capture that green flash with a buffer gate so that I can turn the I can open the door for just as long as I want to. I want this door to open and close quickly so I need to connect power to it. Now let's watch what happens. So every time the timer goes off, this buffer gate captures that green flash and turns green and opens the door for 1 second, just like that. Now, when the magma room fills up, then I can open this door just long enough to let a little magma through at a time and not all of it at once. Um, I think the sweet spot for doing that is more like 0 0.7 seconds and not, you know, one second. And I don't want it to go every five seconds. Let's do it every 60 seconds. I think that's everything. Oh, I have a problem down here. I didn't cut off this rail. Oh, the only thing that's left is to add cooling to this. I mean, I guess I'll do that. I'll set that up and I'll let you see it. But I mean, it's just a matter of setting up an aqua tuner in the steam, right? So no big deal. Okay, I've got that aqua tuner all set up. Nothing to it. It just has a cooling loop. Um, it's set up with a th liquid pipe thermo sensor, just like all my other aqua tuners. And the automation has a filter gate so it doesn't turn on and off all the time. So there it is working.
I think that's the entire setup now, finally. And since you can make three rails of regolith from your meteor showers, you could make three of these. So that's uh, 39,000 watts. Uh, you know, I'm, I didn't really finish the magma dropper here. Um, it's really good to put another tile in so that uh, you don't get, if it's, if it's deep, you don't get a whole bunch all at once. You only get a little at once. And it might be necessary to put in a hydro sensor down here because if you happen to have a bunch of magma piled up down here you definitely don't want to be adding more to it and you can use that hydro sensor to turn the doors off by connecting it to that wire uh, so whenever the hydro sensor is green it turns off the magma dropper door um, so if it's above zero i think that's it